Okay, let's have a look now at how we might encode data uh, when we're actually trying to send it uh, over some kind of uh, connection media. So on the first computer or node, uh, you have a network adapter of some kind, and this will be mirrored on the, uh, the other end. And then you have the adapters are providing some means of connecting to a signaling component. So this might be the wire, it might be fiber optic, um, or in the case of a wireless network, it might be some kind of radio thing. And the challenge for the network adapter is to take binary data that the, the node, the computer says it wants to send, uh, and then to actually be able to uh, transfer that over the signaling component. Uh, and so it needs some way to encode that binary data. And so there's lots of ways that you can do this. Uh, so a really simple one uh, is to simply encode every time you switch between a zero and a one. So NRZ uh, does exactly this. So we start by assuming that we're sending a zero. If we send another zero, we don't change the voltage. If we send another zero, we still don't change the voltage. Oh, now we're gonna send a one. So we have to switch the voltage from the low to high. And then we wanna send a one. So we have to switch back from high to low. And uh, we wanna send a one. So this is, again, if it's different to the previous one, then we toggle whether we're on high or low. And so we have a bunch of bits the same. So we don't change anything um, and uh, do it that way. And of course, what I'm describing in actual fact is saying that a zero will go as a low voltage and a one will go as a high voltage. So this is a really naive, simple way uh, to send, uh, to encode data. Uh, that's quite easy to do in electronics uh, and yeah, it, it can work, but you won't get the maximum capacity out of the, um, uh, the channel necessarily by doing that. So there's problems uh, with it, obviously. So one is that uh, the receiver has to put up with the fact that the, um, uh, the baseline, the base voltage might wander between them. So it has to keep track of the bits to see what's the range of voltage we're seeing at the moment to know where a high and a low is. Um, and you might get interference that might cause a high to get read as a low or a low as high. Uh, and this is a, a problem. And if you have too many ones or too many zeros in a row, then the voltage is not changing, right? It's staying the same. And so this kind of averaging to work out the range of voltages uh, is going to get uh, difficult to um, uh, to connect. So interestingly, this problem comes up not just in uh, communications uh, in real time from end to end, but actually in uh, magnetic media. So the old floppy disks that uh, some of you might have seen or oops, seen or remember, uh, you've got a, a disk of uh, magnetic material in there, and there's a head that writes data, you know, in those loops around there. And it has to write the data in a way that can be recovered back at the other end. And all of these same kind of issues come up. Uh, and one of those issues is clock recovery, whether it's for floppy disks or a network, which is that the frequency at each end is very unlikely to be perfectly matched. Uh, and there are a variety of effects that can also slightly change the speed of uh, propagation of a signal. So temperature can change the speed of propagation uh, in a wire. Uh, interference might uh, cause some uh, variation on time as well. Uh, for radio communications, if it's going through the atmosphere, it might get bent in different ways, uh, or it might bounce off different walls and things to get to the destination, and that might confuse it. Uh, or on the dear old floppy disk, the fact that it's being spun by a mechanical motor means that that rate of uh, rotation actually can vary over time in a variety of ways. So what we want in all of these cases is actually a way that we can encode uh, not only the data, but actually the clock, so that we can recover to know exactly what the data rate is, uh, and hopefully avoid some of these other problems uh, that we were talking about. Uh, so NRZI is uh, non-return to zero inverted. So this is a uh, kind of the, the first variation on this. So now uh, the sender makes a transition uh, to encoder one um, and makes no uh, change to encoder zero. And so this solves this problem where you have lots of consecutive ones. Uh, oops. Uh, but if you have lots of consecutive zeros, you still have a problem, right? Because the, the current uh, will stay the same. Um, so it was a step forward, but not a complete uh, solution. 
Uh, and then Manchester Encoding uh, looked to uh, solve this problem so it does an exclusive OR of the uh, NRZ encoded data and the clock. So now the clock is effectively a signal overlaid uh, over the top uh, of the data, but this effectively halves the, um, uh, the transmission rate of data you can get, but in return for having the, um, uh, the clock recovery. Uh, and again, so this was an issue, not just for uh, communications, but also on floppy disks and things and ha early hard drives as well, uh, in that this really reduced the, um, uh, the rate of uh, data or the amount of storage that you could get uh, on recorded media. And so in this case, you, the, the number of signals per second that are actually on the, um, or the number of transitions that you might get uh, on the line or on the storage media is actually twice the number uh, of the amount of bits of data that you can get. So effectively, uh, you need two transitions to encode uh, some data. Uh, and so uh, the rate at which the, um, uh, the signal changes is uh, called the board rate. And so that can be more or less than the bit rate depending on the encoding. So in the case of Manchester uh, coding, the bit rate is only half of what the board rate is because the signal is changing twice as uh, frequently as you're actually transferring bits. So this is uh, not ideal. So again, if we have a, a look at an example of that, um, here's our original NRZ coding. So low for zero, high for one. Uh, there's our clock. And of course, it, so the clock is um, low for half a cycle and high for half a cycle. So you have a low and a high each uh, time. So then the Manchester uh, coding we are exclusive ORing that together. So now we're seeing that the signal is changing twice as fast as the bits, and we can actually see, so it's low to high for a zero, and it's high to low for a one. And so now we have a transition in every bit, uh, and that's fantastic for the, uh, the clock recovery and, and those kind of aspects. But we now have twice the number of transitions per second, which means it would need twice the bandwidth in order to transfer the, uh, uh, the same amount of data. So NRZI is a little bit interesting in this regard. If we have a look at the number of transitions that are happening over that time in NRZI and the maximum frequency of the transitions, uh, the maximum frequency is only half as often because it's, you know, it's a full bit width, even though it's offset by half a bit. Uh, but in actual fact, for most of the time, the transitions are less frequent. Uh, and so you can effectively get more data in the same bandwidth limited channel by doing something like NRZI. Uh, so long as you don't have a problem with it being uh, the same for too long causing problems. Okay, and we'll come back to this one in the next video.